<laughs> As you're probably, uh, well, some of you will be aware anyway, that we have been doing quite a lot of work on our assignments and workbooks in Cogma, and because we've been changing the whole assignment setup, uh, so we don't have to read people's writing as much because some of their writings are very difficult to understand and uh, some of the students and of course some of the students think that by writing much uh, they have a good chance of getting something right and of course the problem is that we have uh, you know uh, whether it be uh, Sister Anne or, uh, or, or, or uh, uh, Lydia or Rose or uh, you know having to read all the stuff uh, it's just sometimes it just becomes a big waste of time. So we've been changing our assignments so they become all multi-choice uh, and fill in the blanks and true and false. Um, and, and honestly, it has been a tough thing to do, but I'm thankful that we are now down to only two books left that we have to change. So... Uh, I've been working through the module on typology. And I want to tell you, it has been a blessing uh, for me to have gone through that again and to change the assignments. Because one of the things about the assignments is you virtually go through the workbook about five times. And uh, so, so uh, if you don't get it by the time you have finished your assignment, uh, I don't know what else can be done. Uh, so, um, so this week I've been working on the last workbook in the typology um, series, the language of the Bible, and it deals with Jacob's dream. And uh, I want to tell you, I, I saw some things in that, and it caused me to even have to change and add to the workbook itself. Um, as you probably are aware, um, typology and symbolism is very important if you are to rightly divide your Bible. Uh, in fact, if you don't have a good grasp of either typology or symbolism, you'll find it most difficult to understand your Bible. For instance, if you did not understand typology, you would have no chance of understanding the book of Hebrews because uh, the book of Hebrews really is a book of contrast where it contrasts the old with the New Testament. Uh, so you have to be aware, amen, of, 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 of both the picture in the Old Testament and the reality in the New Testament. So uh, I would certainly encourage all of you if you don't do all the workbooks, at least do the module on the language of the Bible, because it will be a tremendous blessing to you. Um, so when we think of typology, what are some of the rules that govern typology? Anybody remember some of them? What is a type? And there was silence in the air. <laughs> Amen. Well, a type is a real, literal Old Testament person, thing or event that has a deeper truth portrayed to it than depicted literally. Get that? So it's, it's a real Old Testament person, thing or event that has some deeper truth attached to it because God wants to use that to teach us something spiritual. Now, you see, a type has an opposite, and that is called the antitype. Now, the antitype does not mean against. It means the opposite or the reverse. That's why I said that the book of Hebrews really is a book of con of con contrast, all right? It's not against. It's simply opposite, you know, where we have the law of Moses, and then we have the law, the law of Christ. We have the tabernacle of Moses and the true tabernacle. Um, <coughs> a type is literal and points to the spiritual or the spiritual reality. Amen. And very important, a type must resemble 
the reality. It's not identical to it. It may not look exactly the same, but there must be a resemblance. There must be a similarity in both its presentation and its meaning. Also, what I think is very important, a type must be ordained because a type foretells, which tells me that God does know the end from the beginning. Because, you see, if you do not have the type, you could not understand the reality. That's the important part, is if you don't understand the type, you will not understand the reality, or you will not understand the New Testament. Oops, just dropped my pencil. <laughs> All right. Um, so, so, so God, in his foreknowledge, knows the end from the beginning. It's a bit like, and it throws some people... Uh, is um, you know the, the, you know whether whether you understand this or not, but the New Testament was actually before the Old Testament, which confuses some people. But if you accept that the New Testament is the reality and that a type is a shadow, then the reality must exist before it can cast a shadow. Yeah. If you remember that Jesus Christ was the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, amen? But he was not revealed until Calvary. So what? So, so Calvary was always there to cast the shadow on all the Old Testament types and symbols, amen? So a type is both a symbol and a prediction, praise the Lord, amen? Other thing is concerning the antitype or the reality is always more glorious, always more glorious than the symbol or the type. Um, accessories like the brazen altar, we we have the the grate or the we have the rings in in the um, uh, furniture of the of of the Old Testament tabernacle. They serve no symbolic um, uh, meaning. Um, the golden, who can remember what the golden rule is? The Bible always interprets itself. Amen. The Bible always interprets itself. As you allow the Holy Spirit to guide you and lead you. Now, also, what's very important about the Bible is that it is not a literal book. If you try and read it as a literal book, you'll become stuck. <laughs> Amen because it is a spiritual book. Amen. So now we're going to look at um, uh, Jacob's uh, dream again in um, Genesis 28. And who would like to read for us verses 11 through 13? Genesis chapter 28. Eleven to 13. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took up the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed and behold, a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reached the heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land whereon thou liest. To thee will I give it and to thy seed. Amen. And read verse four, verse number 17 for us. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Amen. So obviously we're dealing with types or shadows. We're dealing with symbolism. And so now we must look toward the reality what is the spiritual meaning all right now what's really intriguing about um jacob's ladder or the dream that jacob had is that not only do we have symbols pointing to the reality we have symbols that point to other symbols so it takes uh, you know you, you really have to understand symbolism to come to the final reality, amen? So, so that's very, very important. Um, 
So when we go to um, Genesis 28 and verse 12, he has a dream and he sees a ladder that's set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending upon it. Now, what is the mate of this verse? Remember that what's, how do we define a mate? Who can remember that? A mate is like a companion, isn't it? Yeah. A companion, all right? And, and biblically speaking, what we look, why we look for the mate is sometimes we have what's called a dark saying or a difficult verse, and so we need more light. And thank God the Bible is such a resource that it will interpret itself. And God will provide, provide other portions of Scripture to give light on that which may at first seem a little difficult to understand. We call that a companion verse or a mate. So what do you think the mate of Genesis 28 verse 12 is? Some of you may have your... Yeah, your phone or whatever going there, and you should be see see a reference uh, to a particular verse that refers also to the angels ascending and descending. John one fifty one. That's yeah. the one. Amen. Yeah. What does it say? And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter you shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Amen. So we have this ladder, and then we have the angels ascending and descending upon the ladder. Now, I suppose one of the first questions we should ask ourselves is, um, when was the ladder raised up? When was the ladder raised up? Who can answer that one? When Jesus was crucified. Amen. All right, a good verse for that, uh, to understand that, would be John 12, verse 32. He said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto myself. We also now begin to understand uh, who the ladder represents. Who does the ladder represent? Who is the Son of Man? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, and apparently... I haven't counted them all, but there are some 32 references in the New Testament that identify Jesus Christ as being the Son of Man. Notice how simple the Bible is. If you understand a little bit about symbolism, about typology, and you allow the Bible to speak for itself. Amen? Now, it said, it says, the top of it reached heaven. Wow. Which heaven do you think Jacob saw? Remember, the Bible speaks of how many heavens? Three, three heavens, all right? Three, three heavens. And you know that... Um, People have tried to get into the three into the three three heavens. The first heaven is what Genesis chapter one, which we call the literal or the firmament heaven. And if you remember, what did the people in Babel try and do? Mm. Well, it's <laughs> <out>. <laughs> they decided they, they were going to build this big tower. Yeah, and somehow get into the heavens somehow, and into the sky. And then so uh, anyway, that didn't work out too, 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 too well for them. <laughs> Amen. And of course, uh, in today, especially today's modern so-called religion, we have so many preachers and people who think they've been to the heaven of God. Yeah. And they speak that they've walked with, you know, with Jesus and they've walked with Paul and ask Paul questions and and of course that's all just absolute lies mm -hmm. and and simply uh, the devil speaking trying to confuse a whole bunch of people 
Amen. Mm -hmm. So which heaven do you think that Jacob saw? Where was the ladder going to? Was it the Babel heaven? Was it the Ecclesiastes 5 heaven? Or was it the Ephesians 2 and verse 6 heaven? Yeah. Which one do you think? Hmm? Third heaven? Uh, that's the one for sure. <laughs> Amen. That's the one for sure. Uh, I'm not sure. I think it might be some. Who's got? Is it Psalm 132, which talks about the habitation of God? Somebody might have a quick look for me. I, I don't have the reference here. Remember that uh, book number 16 of Topology. Now it's a pretty big book, so I haven't got time to read the whole thing now. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But who who did who was at the top of the ladder? Or well, where did the ladder reach up to? What does it say? Who stood above the ladder? Well, it says the Lord stood above it. Yeah. Amen. The Lord stood above it. Our question then is, where is the Lord? Where is he? He's in the heavenly place. Well, if somebody got the reference for me, I think it's Psalm 132. I'm not sure. Yes, Talks about 13. Zion. What does it say? For the Lord hath chosen Zion, he hath desired it for his habitation. Amen. He Zion. Rest forever. He will I dwell, for I have desired it. Amen. How long is he going to be there? For, for a long, time. long time. <laughs> Amen. 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 So mm -hmm. if you could almost say that, that the top of the ladder is the heavenly place, that's where Christ is. Yeah. Amen. Isn't, 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 isn't that the truth? Mm -hmm. um, next question. Then I'll find my page. Who are the angels who are ascending and descending? The ladder. God's people, messengers of God. Yeah, if we if we think of the ladder, a ladder is like a a ladder gets you from one place to another. Correct. Connection. Yeah. In fact, what a ladder does really is it takes you to one place that you otherwise could not go to. Mm. We could also say it's a vertical bridge. And of course, we've already understood that um, the ladder represented the son, the son of man, or Jesus Christ, which of course then ties up with John fourteen verse six, does it not? That He is the way; no man cometh unto the Father but through Jesus Christ. You've got to go up the ladder. <laughs> Amen. Isn't that correct? Yeah. Okay. Now, the word angel has. Two meanings, both in the Hebrew and the Greek. Um, what's so good about the Hebrew language as opposed to the Greek language or the English language? It gives character. It gives character, amen? See, the word angel in the Greek is the word malak, sorry, in the Hebrew is malak, which means a messenger or ambassador. Where in the Greek, it's simply angelos, which means messenger. Amen. Mm -hmm. So what we see is these angels who are climbing the ladder, going up and down. And the important part is they first ascend and then descend. All right. So we know that the ladder was set up on the earth. It was set up on the day of no, not on the day of Pentecost. It was set up on when? At Calvary, was it not? When Jesus was lifted up. Amen. Now, if these were celestial angels, what would the order of climbing be? They would descend and then ascend. 
Amen. That'd be the other way around. So these are obviously not celestial angels, but terrestrial angels. And of course, we understand that Paul spoke that we are ambassadors. Paul also referenced himself as being an angel of God. And of course, uh, a lot of people don't seem to read this, but in Revelation chapter 22, the angel there, whom John actually fell down and worshipped, was told to stand up because that angel was not a celestial angel, was not God or a representation of God, but was actually a fellow believer. Amen. So you're going to be careful when you try and identify angels. Amen. Because predominantly and most angel references are actually human beings and both good ones and bad ones. <laughs> Amen. So, so, so we now now know that uh, the latter, uh, the angels, are the born again believers. Would that be correct? Yeah. Amen. So next, I want to go to page number twenty. So I'm leafing through the book, hmm. trying to get the highlights. All right. Yeah, you are right, sister. Psalm 132, 13 and fourteen. Which says that, uh, which says the habitation of God is Zion. Okay, tells us that God has clearly chosen the Church of God to be His habitation or dwelling place. Amen. Now, next question. I want to go to, um, well, we'll go to John 10, verse 9. Because yes, again, confirming that it says they go up and then they go down, which is the exact same order we find in John 10, and verse 9, is it not? Has somebody got that one for us? I am the door by me. If any man shall enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Amen. Amen. You've got to go in and then you go out. All right. So first you ascend, that's going in, and then you descend, going out. And of course, obviously, that going in and going out is not saved and unsaved. Yeah. It's simply what do you think? receiving the message in and then bringing it out to others. Absolutely, is receiving the message from God, yeah. from the heavenly place, and then taking it into the highways and hedges. Amen. Amen. See, God calls us to go into all the world, but not to preach our message, yeah. not to preach our witness, but to preach his witness and his testimony. Isn't that correct? Mm -hmm. Amen. So the angels are people and not celestial beings. Amen. Now, so we understand all that, and all that's great. We understand that um, we're dealing with a ladder which represents the Son of the Son of Man, which is Jesus Christ. We know we're dealing with the angels going up and down, which are the redeemed. We understand that the heaven is the heavenly place because uh, God is there. Amen. But then what happened after what happened after um, uh, Jacob had finished his dream? I didn't quite see this before, but now I do. <laughs> Amen. And obviously he woke up. But if you look at Genesis 28, Verse 16 and 17. It says, And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place? There is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. 
So what happens is he has a dream. And then when he awakens from the dream, he has a revelation. It's a bit like, if I can put it this way, it's a bit like Peter. He had like a trance, a vision, a dream. And then when he awoke, if I can put it that way, he received a revelation. You remember, he saw the unclean animals. And then he understood that those unclean animals, the revelation was that those were the Gentiles mm -hmm. and that they were actually clean. All right. Mm -hmm. Amen. And so in the same respect now, we find that Jacob wakes up. So first of all, we have, if you like, almost like word for word what his dream was. And then he wakes up and tells us what he understood concerning the dream. And he said, concerning his dream, he saw the house of God and the gate of heaven. But again, we're dealing with symbolism. Mm. All right. So like I said, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, we, we deal with symbols that lead to more symbols that can lead to more symbols before you come to the reality. All right. So previously in Genesis 28 and verse 12 and John 1 verse 51, the type pointed to the anti-type Jesus Christ. Correct? That the latter represented Jesus Christ. But now Jacob wakes up and the revelation he has is that the latter is the house of God. And the gate of heaven or the gate into heaven. Do you notice that? There's now a difference. If you're going to put it in its raw form, the latter represented Jesus Christ. But now in Revelation, it's now the house of God, which I found interesting because now we have a double picture that also fulfills the time period and its fulfillment. Because what we see now is we have the foretelling of both the work of salvation in Christ's, and this is a new word I learnt, corporal body, which means his physical body and also his spiritual body. Because remember, Christ has both a, or sorry, had a corporal body or a literal body, but he also has a spiritual body. There is both, if I can put it this way, both a physical incarnation and a spiritual incarnation of Christ. Amen. You see, Jesus appeared at the beginning of the gospel day in what form? In his physical form. Hmm. But then he returned at a second coming on the day of Pentecost in a spiritual form. Yeah. And of course, that's the truth concerning Hebrews 9 and 28. I have no idea why people continue to look for Jesus' second coming. Yeah. <laughs> According to Hebrews 9 and 26, his physical incarnation was to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. But then his second or his spiritual incarnation was what? For what purpose? Salvation. Salvation. Amen. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ and his resurrection dealt with sin, but it does not provide new life. No. 
Amen. So Hebrews 9.28 says, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time, without sin, not dealing with sin, but unto salvation. Amen. The other important thing is this. Jesus' fleshy body, his flesh body was actually, if you like, sent from God in type or symbol because Hebrews 10 and verse 5 says, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared for me. Yeah. Amen. But you see, the second time that Jesus appeared, not in a physical body clothed in physical flesh, but spirit. Mm. Why did he have to come in spirit? If we can put it this way here. At his first coming, he inhabited one physical body. Yeah. But when he came spirit on the day of Pentecost, he came to inhabit all who were saved or born again, to become his spiritual body. Amen? You see, Christ's spiritual incarnation is the great mystery. Paul said so. Amen? What was the great mystery that so many have not got the revelation of yet? The mystery was... Christ in you. Amen. Christ in you. Amen. The glory. Amen. See, by virtue of the atoning work of Christ through his death and resurrection, on the day of Pentecost, God sent down a spiritual body. In the book of Revelations, it's, it's symbolically called what? New Jerusalem. Amen. Remember, it says, you know, John says, and he says, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, yeah. prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. The New Jerusalem, the city of God, is what? Sure. Okay. Amen. Again, the book of the Revelations is symbolism. So it must point to a reality somewhere. Where is the reality? Mm -hmm allowing the Bible to interpret itself. Yep. Of course, it's Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 and 23, which tells us that the city of the living God, the new Jerusalem, or heavenly Jerusalem, is actually the church of the firstborn, the church of Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus Christ? He is God. Amen? Amen. 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 So, 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 so again, it's, it's a picture of the church. Now, just as Christ's literal body, through his work on Calvary, bridged the chasm between heaven and earth, so the church of God as his spiritual body now in the gospel day, bridges that self-same chasm. Mm. You see, in the book of Hebrews, Jesus is described as the apostle and high priest of the household of God. But, you know, Peter described the body of Christ the spiritual body, as a royal priesthood. Why is the body of Christ a royal priesthood? Part of, part of Christ's spiritual body. Royalty. Mm. Why is it a royal priesthood? Obviously, it's a priesthood, for a starter, which just means it stands in the place of the priest stands in the place of. Yeah. Why is it a royal priesthood? What makes her royal? Again, it's the great mystery. Because Christ, the King of kings, inhabits or dwells in 
the believer. That's what makes her royal. Yeah. Amen. Therefore, everyone who is born again is a spiritual bridge builder. God made it that way. Mm -hmm. Amen. You see, to repeat Jacob's revelation concerning the latter being the house of God, according to 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15, Paul's words, he says, he says, if I tarry long, but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how to behave yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. What is the house of God? What did Jacob see symbolically? He saw the church of God. Amen. He saw that the latter represented not necessarily the physical incarnation of Jesus Christ, but the spiritual incarnation of Jesus Christ. Mm. Question. When was the latter raised? When was the latter raised? The latter was raised through his physical incarnation at Calvary, if I be lifted up. But when, when did the first begin to climb the ladder? Pentecost. Day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost in 31 AD, for 40 days, the ladder stood and nobody climbed. Yep. They could not climb. It was not possible to, you can't climb through Jesus' physical body. No. I mean, you must come through his spiritual body which came down on the day of Pentecost. Yeah. Amen. I, I, again, it's just, just so annoying that so many people disregard the truth concerning his second coming. Salvation rests on that truth. Yeah. No person can be saved. You know, I'll put it, uh, no person can be saved. I, 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 I better not say that abs in, in an absolute way. But at some point, the understanding must come that Christ dwells in you. Mm. At some point, you must come to a understanding that there is a spiritual incarnation of Jesus Christ, and it took place on the day of Pentecost. Mm -hmm. Isn't that right? Yeah. So, so when you carefully study Jacob's dream in Genesis 28, plus his revelation, you get the exact time frame that the fulfillment of what he saw was going to take place. Mm. First of all, Jesus gives a hint, if you like, a little hint in, 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 in John 1 verse 51, when he said, hereafter. Amen. But then, of course, then we get the big hint that the letter actually represents the house of God, the church of God. Therefore, we know that we're dealing with Pentecost in 31 AD. Amen. See, that's how, pre pre how precise the Bible can be if we dig and study and search things out. We don't have to guess anything. Amen. Because remember, the church of God, the body of Christ, is the new Jerusalem. Amen. Now, Jacob also received the revelation concerning the gate of heaven, which I found interesting. Mm -hmm. He said, the ladder, which is the house of God, is also the gate of heaven. Mm -hmm. And I don't think he was speaking about Peter's pearly gates. <laughs> what do you think? I don't think he was talking about the gates of hell. Amen. I am 
I don't think it was the heaven of Ecclesiastes 5 and 2. I believe we're dealing with the third heaven, the heavenly place of Ephesians 2 and 6, as we discussed earlier. Now, that word gate in the Hebrew is the word shah, S-H-A-A-R, which means opening, but it can also mean a door. Amen. And, of course, when we think about door, what do we think of? Where does it lead us in the New Testament? That I am the Amen. It leads us to John chapter 10, doesn't it? Yeah. Amen. Where Jesus said, I am the door. Yeah, if any man. Amen. Which just fits our narrative perfectly, doesn't it? I am the door. But is physical Jesus the door? No. Spiritual. Or is his spiritual incarnation the door? Spiritual body. Well, again, he tells us. He said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. Yeah. According to Hebrews 9 and 28, when does salvation come? At his second coming, yeah. not his first coming. You see, once you get some of your beliefs straightened out, <laughs> amen, the Bible becomes crystal clear. Scriptures become crystal clear. Because now each time you read the word saved, you know you're dealing with the spiritual incarnation of Christ, his second coming, not his first coming. We weren't saved by his first coming, if I can put it that way. That was part of the process. It dealt with the sin question. Yeah. Amen. Now, where do mankind find access to Christ? Where is the door? Where is the door? Where is the door? Place? That's a good question. Where is the door? In the heavenly place, that Christ himself. Well, the door is found in Revelation 1 verse 13. Yes. Jesus said, I am the door, <laughs> so where is Christ? Well, verse 13, because remember we're dealing with a picture of Christ and the church of God. So I think if you're going to deal with typology and deal with symbols, you've got to look at the picture. Can't just be any picture. The picture is dealing with Christ because initially in Jacob's dream, he sees the son of the Son of Man. But then when he gets the revelation, what does he see? He sees the house of God. Amen. So we've got to tie those two together. And of course, it's beautifully put together for us in Revelation 1 verse 13. It says, in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his foot and gird about with the pap, gird about the paps with a golden girdle. What does the seven candlesticks represent? Seven Sorry, so I didn't get, get seven it. Seven in the seven time period. I mean, yeah, so it's, I mean, there's only one, there's only one uh, church, right? One church. I think, it's, yeah, I think that's Ephesians chapter four. All right. Okay, so it's, a, so it's a symbol that represents the church, as you said, uh, in the seven periods of the gospel day. But notice that it once again, you know, the Bible seems to repeat over and over, especially the New Testament, the great mystery. Christ 
in you. Christ in you. Where is Christ? In, you. in the church. Or okay. well, the church is the spiritual body of Christ. Okay. It also confirms for those who think Jesus is somewhere in coming, <laughs> all right, <laughs> that you cannot separate God from the church. Amen? You, it's not possible. Amen. The body now, so the body of the body of Christ is charged to show lost mankind the way to the door. Amen. We are to show the way to the gate or the door of heaven, or the heavenly place. How do we do that? How does the spiritual incarnation of Christ do that today? Is Jesus Christ walking around the shores of Galilee? No. Is Jesus preaching somewhere? No. No, he's not. See, God decided in his wisdom, amen, that he would not simply dwell one body. He was going to dwell many bodies or indwell many, many bodies and called that body the body of Christ, the church. So Paul in Hebrew, sorry, in Romans chapter 10 tells us, verse 14, how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? I love that. And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Or well, Jesus is not going to preach to them. And the answer is verse 15. And how shall, and how shall they preach except they be sent? Notice that, sent. What does sent mean? They must have come from somewhere. They must have ascended somewhere and then descended. Mm -hmm. this, this, is, this is just, it's not, it's, 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 uh, it's not that we decide we're going to send Robin to Africa. So you're going to say, no, you, I'm not going. But if she ascended into the heavenly place and God says, I send you, then she'd better start marching, start booking a ticket. See the difference? Mm -hmm. She went to the heavenly place. God gave her the message and then sent her. Paul has the same testimony over and over and over again. Paul did not go by his own strength or by his own, oh, I think this is a good idea. He was a sent person, amen, somebody whom God had sent. So he must have climbed into the heavenly place, received the message, and then went down and delivered the message. True? Because that's what we do. We show the gate of heaven, the door to heaven. He said, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. You see, the gate of heaven is found where? Where do you find the gate? There's only one place you can find it. Place. You won't find it in the, Pente in the Pentecostal religious nonsense. You won't find it in the Roman Catholic religious nonsense. The Baptist won't tell you because they don't know. The gate of heaven is found in the church of God. Amen. See, the only way lost people will be introduced to Christ and find the door is if faithful believers will ascend to God to receive his message and then descend 
and bring it to lost mankind. What is the gate of heaven? It's the gospel preached. What is the gate of heaven? It is revealed by the church. Amen. You see, the body of Christ is also the living epistle, is it not? The body of Christ is charged to what? To preach the testimony of Christ. Remember in Acts chapter, uh, is it Acts chapter 1 verse 8? What did Jesus tell his disciples to do? Who's got it there for us so we can get it in a more accurate form? But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. Now notice you. that. You shall be witnesses unto me. You shall speak my testimony. And the only way you'll get his testimony is to climb the ladder. and receive it directly from him. You do not, see, remember, it's the letter that does what? He didn't mean simply repeat the words in the Bible, because we've already learnt that many times, amen, what he says in the Bible, he speaks to specific people in his time period. And so it has no connection to us other than the truth he intended back in that day. Hmm. You must ascend the ladder to receive the testimony, his testimony, and then bring that to the lost. And in that way, we reveal the door. Isn't that correct? You see, again, most false religious groups do what? What is their door? They produce a message that draws people to their denomination, their mm. group. Mm. I mean, they have specific rituals, call them rituals. I mean, that you must perform to enter their group, whether it be feet washing, whether it be water baptism, whether it's chewing on a piece of dried bread and some juice from coals or Aldi or whatever, and only then can you be part of their group because it's just nonsense style, if you like, the wrong incarnation of Christ. I'll put it that it's the wrong incarnation of Christ. Mm. We are called to preach the spiritual incarnation of Christ. The only way you can do that is to climb the ladder, get the message, get the testimony from him. It's a bit like, again, you know, <laughs> it was it Matthew chapter 5 or Matthew chapter 6. Yeah, you've heard it said. You've heard it said. You've heard it said. You've heard it said. You've heard it said in old times. And much of what you hear today by most preachers is you've heard it said, you've heard it said, you've heard it said. They're just repeating the same nonsense that they hear from somebody else over and over and over and over again. But Jesus said, I say unto you. And that's what we need to bring to people, what God says to them. Mm -hmm. Not what I say, not what you say, but what God says. We've got to climb the ladder. Amen. Get the revelation as Paul said he did. Amen. When he went to the third, the third heaven to receive what? The revelation of Jesus Christ. It's like it is a specific doing of something. Amen. So as I said, I, yeah, I just found so much more. In the study on typology, I've had to obviously rework the uh, final book in the typology um, uh, module. 
to bring some revelation on, on some of these things. Um, you know, I, I do believe unless you have a, a grasp of typology, the Bible um, will be a difficult book. <laughs> Amen. But it's supposed to be a simple book. John saw it as what? He said, uh, it's crystal clear. And it should be crystal clear. But you've got to, it's a bit like you've got to put all your ducks in a row. Is that right? <laughs> so anyway, that's for, anyway, that's for me today. Uh, um, well, just so you know, 